We're going to talk about what the rush is. <clears throat> but first, I'm going to start with a story. This is a, a, a thing, a being I saw in my uh, yard last summer. It looks like a fecal sac that a, a bird dropped out of its nest. If you take a closer look, you say, well, gee, maybe that's a spider. Look at it at night. Indeed, it is a spider. It's a bola spider. And this is how bola spiders hunt. They drop a single strand of silk. Somebody's got a mute out there, I think. Uh, and they put a little sticky, sticky glob of glue at the end. And it looks like they're going to go fishing with it. Well, I didn't think uh, this spider would be able to catch anything, but a few minutes later, it did. A moth flew in and it got caught on its sticky glob of glue, wraps it up in silk, has a nice meal. Uh, and if it does that enough time, it has the energy to create a, an egg mass. And that's exactly what this spider did. As a matter of fact, she made three egg masses. So how does she catch a moth like this? Well, she's actually releasing the sex pheromone of particular species of moth. I want to know what the species was. So I unwrapped the things that she was catching and it turned out it's the bronze cutworm. She caught 10 bronze cutworms in a, in a row in my yard and I've got bronze cutworms and the caterpillars that create a bronze cutworm because I've got goldenrod. That's their famous, their favorite uh, host plant. Uh, and the tree I was looking at was an oak tree uh, which produced this beautiful moth, a dot line white. And I've got dot line whites uh, from produced by this tree in my yard because I didn't rake the leaves away because there's a dot line white uh, cocoon in this, this little leaf mass right here. And there it is. I'm sure you saw it right away. Here it is up close. If you rake them away, you've just thrown away that beautiful moth. I've got evening primrose moths in my yard because I've got evening primrose. And the moth comes and, and spends the day with its head stuffed in the flower. It's very cute. I've got zebra swallowtails because I've got pawpaws that I planted there for that exact reason to create, to, uh, <clears throat> attract that beautiful moth. It would take me a week or more to describe all of the species that are now calling our property home because of the plants that we have put back there. It would not take me a week, it wouldn't take me very long at all to describe all the species that are living in a landscape like this, a typical suburban landscape. There is no goldenrod, so there are no bronze cutworms, so there are no bola spiders. There are no oaks, so there are no dot line whites, whites or hundreds of other species. There are no pawpaws, so there's Oh, give me a break. I don't know why I do that. There we go. So there are no zebra swallowtails. Sorry about that. There are no enotheras, no, no evening primroses. Uh, so uh, we have no, no uh, evening primrose moths. There is very little life that can live in a typical landscape like this. And of course, you know that. But that is why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines. The insect apocalypse is here, talking about global insect decline. North America's lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. A third of our North American bird population is already gone. Two thirds of Earth's wildlife is gone. One million species face extinction in the next 20 years. 40% of Earth's plants face extinction. These are big problems, folks. These are big problems. And they're problems because we have not shared the planet with the natural world. We're taking the resources for ourselves. And that's why Elizabeth Colbert gets to write The Sixth Great Extinction. I'll bet she would have been happier if she didn't have to write that book. Jason Hinkle says, biodiversity loss is such a strange euphemism for the mass destruction of non-human beings. Uh, it's the genocide of nature is really what we're talking about. So what's our reaction to these sobering statistics? People are actually studying that. Richard Hobbs uh, wrote a paper about it. He likens the, uh, our, our uh, reactions to the five stages of grief that we experience when we get typically a, a, a news of a terminal illness. First, there's denial. We certainly have plenty of people denying that we have a problem at all. Then there's anger. I feel a little bit of that sometimes. Bargaining, depression, I feel a little bit of that sometimes too. And then the final stage of grief is acceptance. And this is where I take issue. Uh, acceptance is too easily equated with giving up. Uh, and giving up is not an option, folks, because, because nature is not optional. We absolutely need it. So we need a sixth step here, and that is action. That's what Homegrown National Park's all about, taking action. And we do have existing national parks, uh, and they were created primarily because they had exquisite scenery. They were beautiful places. Teddy Roosevelt said, we've got to preserve these places because that's good administration. Um, natural beauty is a national asset uh, and recreation produces good, good citizenship. So our parks uh, were, were created largely because they were pretty places uh, in which we could play. 
And that's why we only have about 12% of the US that's formally protected. These dark green areas are where we have our major parks because there's not all that many places that are exquisitely beautiful where we can play. What's happening outside the parks though has been appalling. Every 30 seconds, a football field worth of America's natural resources disappears to development. Development, I think it's the most oxymoronic word we have certainly in, in the field of ecology. We've got over 40 million acres of lawn. That's an area the size of New England dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Uh, and an even deaderscape is what we've paved over. We've paved over an area larger than Ohio. There are 2 million acres of golf courses. That's an area larger than Rhode Island and Delaware combined. Uh, and we could go on talking about many other statistics. Now, Matt Lee Ashley has observed that evaluating the condition of nature is a bit like watching a leaking pipe. If a person focuses on each drop as it falls to the floor, the leak doesn't seem very damaging. But if you leave for a day and you come back, your room is gonna be full of water. And that's exactly what has happened. Now we're talking about an extinction crisis. It is indeed an extinction crisis, but uh, I don't think extinction is the right metric that we should use. We have an extinction crisis, but we have, to, we have to think about the degradation of common species. Species like the picture you're seeing here, this is the uh, American chestnut. It used to be the dominant tree uh, in our, our Eastern deciduous forest from Maine all the way to Georgia. It's not extinct yet, but it's functionally extinct. It is, it is wiped out by the um, chestnut blight. The rusty patch bumblebee used to be one of the most common bees in North America. Uh, now it's a big deal if anybody sees even one of them. So it's functionally extinct. Beavers, now we do, and beavers are making somewhat of a comeback, but they used to be common in every stream system of the entire country. Their elimination drastically changed the hydrology of the entire country and it wasn't for the better. So we're really talking about defaunation. That's the real problem. It's local and it's everywhere. Enter E.O. Wilson, uh, Harvard Emeritus. Everybody knows Edward O. Wilson spent his life uh, studying lots of things, but he certainly was trying to save biodiversity. And his probably his biggest contribution in that regard was this book that he wrote in 2016, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. And in this book, he, he uh, noted that in order to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we're going to have to save nature. We're going to have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet. And if we don't do that, it's going to just disappear everywhere. And he spent most of the book uh, talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he ended the book. Um, he didn't tell us a whole lot about how we were going to do that. Now, fortunately, and, and somewhat to my surprise, people are actually listening uh, to his, his Half Earth Initiative. Uh, the UN has, has uh, created a global initiative. Initiative First, the 30 by 30, we're going to save 30% of the planet by 2030. And that's step one going towards uh, 50 by 50. So the UN is doing what the UN does. They get a bunch of people together and they're, they're negotiating uh, how we're going to protect biodiversity. And it's not going any better than all the negotiations about climate change have, have gone. Can you imagine negotiating whether or not we're going to save life on, on planet Earth? Well, that's exactly what the UN is doing. Um, and everybody's got this notion in their, eye, in their head that, that, that we're actually going to save 50% of the Earth uh, as, as pristine ecosystems. How could this be possible? Well, it can't be possible. It's not possible. Half of planet Earth is already in some form of agriculture, uh, certainly not pristine. We've got 7.9, soon to be 8 billion people in the other half, uh, along with all of our, our infrastructure and our detritus. Uh, there isn't 50% of planet Earth that is still pristine. So how can we realize EO's dream? Well, uh, actually, I think, I think the answer is obvious. We're going to need a new approach to conservation, and it's not about putting pristine areas aside. It's about restoring the areas that we have destroyed, and we're going to do that by finding ways for humans and nature to coexist. In the, in the past, we've had this idea that they cannot coexist, uh, but what I, what I have been arguing for a long time now is that um, Coexisting with nature is now the only viable option that's left to us. We absolutely have to find ways to do that. In the past, of course, conservation has worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. Uh, so we now need to practice conservation where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. And I'm not just talking about conserving what's there. I'm talking about restoring what is already lost. So in other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, 
but thrive. So if protected areas uh, are, are not large enough, we're going to have to practice conservation outside of those protected areas, outside of preserved areas. So we're going to have to practice conservation in areas like this, but also in areas like this. And as Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young once said, uh, if you can't be with the nature you love, love the nature you're with. I might break into song if I think about that too much. Where are we talking about? We're talking about private property. 78% of the U.S. is, is privately owned. Um, and 85% and of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is, is privately owned. So we have to practice conservation on private property. And lawn is the low hanging fruit. It's really what got me thinking about uh, Homegrown National Park to begin with. We have more than 40 million acres of lawn. That's a 2005 statistic. So we know it's bigger than that now. Um, and you know, it is, a, it is a leftover from the class system. The aristocracy of Europe were the only ones who could afford lawn. And so it's a status symbol and we love our status symbols dedicated to an ecological deadscape. So I know we need, we need lawn for high status and we need lawn to display our, our Halloween decorations. Uh, but what if, if we replanted half the area that is now in lawn? That's the idea I had way back in 1987. That would give us 20 million acres that we could put towards conservation right at home. We could create homegrown national park, which will be huge. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountain. And of all those parks, it's still less than 20 million acres. So homegrown national park will be the biggest park in the country. I started talking about that in my talks for years. Uh, and then I finally, uh, when I wrote Nature's Best Hope, I included it as a chapter. But, um, you know, talk is cheap. That's pretty much all I do. Uh, and then I did meet Michelle and she talked about how, how, uh, <laughs> how this started. She came up to me after a talk and said, you're, you're just talking to the choir. And I said, yes, it's only the choir who invites me. And she said, well, you're not going to succeed unless you get beyond the choir. You have to use social media, you've got to use marketing and you've got to do all the things that, that I know she was correct. But I said, I don't do those things. And she said, I do do those things. So, so let's do it. And that's where homegrownnationalpark.org came from. Um, the ideas you see expressed here are, are all Michelle's. What are we asking in Homegrown National Park? We're saying we need to reduce the area in lawn. That is the low hanging fruit. We've got to put more natives into our landscapes and we've got to remove the invasive species that are already there. Our product is national awareness, not just of what the problem is, but what the solutions are. We're gonna change the culture. We're gonna recognize that nature's not optional. It's not something we, we should do. It's something we absolutely must do. And it's everybody's responsibility to do it. And the map, once it's uh, fully operational, will be uh, allow us to measure our conservation progress. It'll be a powerful scientific tool. Homegrown National Party is going to convert hope to action. We need action. It's aspirational. It doesn't rely on governmental support. Not that we would turn it down if anybody offers it. It's going to merge existing conservation efforts like Audubon and National Wildlife Federation and Wild Ones. Uh, we're not, you know, it's no paid membership here. We're not stealing members from anybody. We're uniting them so that we can all have one visual in terms of our progress. And that visual will reveal holes in our biological corridors. Uh, that, that uh, we're going to need in order to connect the wild places that remain. So what we're envisioning is uh, something like the COVID maps you see in the New York Times, where uh, each county will be colored in with the progress it's making. This is, this is a simulation, of course. But we're talking about a, a science-based grassroots call to action that can address the two major problems we have in this, in this uh, on planet Earth. We've got climate change, but we've got a biodiversity crisis. And Homegrown National Park will address both of those simultaneously. So what's the rush? Well, remember these statistics. Um, they're, not, they're not waiting. They're coming every day. Uh, there is great urgency in enacting this Homegrown National Park solution. We've got 48 million residential landscapes in the US. If we add 1,000 properties, to Homegrown National Park each month. It sounds like great progress, but it'll take us 4,083 years to reach all of them. So that's not quite fast enough. If we look at that in terms of, of property size, the average lot size in the US is three tenths of an acre. So if we add 1,000 acres to Homegrown National Park each month, it'll take us 1,200 years to convert all landscapes. 
Ooh, somebody's got to mute. So who's gonna help Homegrown National Park make this rapid transition? The problem is most people do not garden themselves. They just hire somebody. It's not that they don't like nature or they don't like gardening. They don't have time. They're raising kids or doing other things. So they hire somebody. So what we need to do is create the person that they're going to hire. We need to create a, a team of, of skilled ecological landscapers uh, there are groups doing that now. We need more of them. They need to do it faster. Every place I go to give a talk, people say, who can I hire? And I usually don't know. Uh, but once this team is in place, these people are going to have the information that, that everybody needs. Ecological landscapers are going to know that every landscape has four ecological responsibilities. It's got to support food webs so that we have functioning ecosystems. It's got to sequester carbon, get that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It has to manage our watershed excuse me, and it has to support pollinators. And they're gonna know that lawn accomplishes none of those goals. So our fascination with the lawn is going to end. Uh, they're going to know that plant choice matters. There are three kinds of plants out there, contributors, non-contributors, and detractors. A contributing plant is, is one that's helping to enhance local ecosystems. It's going to be a native. Some are much better than others. Uh, a non-contributor would be something like, like ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia. It's not an invasive plant, but it contributes very little to ecosystem function. And a detractor would be an invasive plant like calorie pear, uh, which becomes an ecological tumor. It escapes and, and um, pushes out the native plants in our functioning ecosystems. Uh, ecological landscapers are going to know that, that caterpillars are an essential component to our landscapes. They are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. And they're gonna know that keystone plants are our keystone plants because they support the most caterpillars. Just 14% of our native plants are, are supporting 90% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs, which makes keystone plants essential components of the ecological houses that we're building. They're the support system. Our house isn't gonna stand up with, without keystone plants. We've been trying to build ecological houses out of wallpaper for the last hundred years, and that doesn't work. And they're also going to know that uh, uh, insects are the little things that run the world. Uh, E.O. Wilson's famous, famous statement. They're going to know that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat the particular plants for which they have the adaptations to, to get around their, their particular defenses. So think monarch butterflies eating toxic milkweeds. Very few other insects can do that. You take away the milkweeds, you take away the monarch butterflies. They're gonna know that we need pollinators, but they're also gonna know it's not because they're pollinating a third of our crops. You hear that every day on the news. It's actually about a 12th of our crops, but then people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Everybody needs pollinators because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. Losing our pollinators is not an option unless we want to lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. They're also going to know that light pollution and mosquito fogging are two of the major causes of insect declines. Uh, and they're fairly easily reversed. If we put in yellow bulbs instead of our white bulbs, it's going to de decrease insect loss to light pollution. And we can, of course, fire mosquito joe pretty easily. They're going to know that, that uh, tiny properties can be very important in terms of conservation. Uh, it can happen on any size property, right from a flower pot on up. And most of all, they're going to know uh, that conservation works. It's going to, make it, going to make it worthwhile. And I'll give you just one example of, of what's happened at uh, our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. This is what it looked like when we moved in. It was part of a farm that was broken up into 10 acre lots. Uh, and, and had been mowed for hay. Very little life there. As a matter of fact, where it wasn't mowed for hay, it was, it was uh, nothing but invasive plants. That's my wife, Cindy, there getting rid of these invasives. It can be done. This is what it looks like today. Uh, and once our research showed that, that uh, the number of moth species you have in your local food web is a great index for how, how healthy that food web is, how complex and stable it is. I started counting the moth species that have come to our barren landscape since we moved in, and I am up to 1,140 species of moths, um, which is, that's 44% of all the moths that occur in the entire state of, of Pennsylvania. They are there because we put the plants back. And because so many of them are types of bird food, we now support 60 species of birds that have bred on our property, not flew by, but bred. But 
uh, is reducing the lawn enough? That was the low-hanging fruit, but uh, if you look at the numbers, there are issues with that. We've got 1.9 billion acres uh, in the lower 48 states. Less than 12% or 228 million acres are protected, so not very much. That leaves 1.6 billion acres unprotected. Now, 78% of that, or 1.3 billion acres, is privately owned. If Homegrown National Park restores 20 million of those acres, that's only 1.53% of what really needs to be restored. So our goals are too modest. We have to increase them uh, by doing more than shrinking the lawn. Most of our privately owned land is in small woodlots, cropland and rangeland, and we wanna get uh, uh, owners of all those properties in Homegrown National Park as well. There are 406 million acres of woodlots managed by private citizens, not logging companies in the US. If they're managed properly by managing the invasives in those woodlots and by sustainably harvesting those woodlots, they all should be on homegrown national park. This is where our, our croplands are, 410 million acres are now in cropland, uh, big area. Uh, but there are things that, that our, our farmers can do. We can restore the native plants on the edges of the fields. We can put in prairie strips. Uh, we can restore uh, hedgerows that have been removed, and we can stop using neonicotinoid uh, pesticides. All of those things will vastly increase the biodiversity in our farmlands. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland, all of which could be good uh, uh, habitat if it's managed properly. We overgraze an awful lot of it. That, by the way, is four and a half times the size of Texas. If we restore the riparian carters that go through those rangelands, research is showing that that restores the biodiversity over the entire area. Uh, very doable. Now, there's something that's common to each one of these conservation approaches. Uh, I learned this from, from um, one of my students uh, in a class last semester. In a paper she wrote, she said, we, we claim to be managing species and habitats, but what we're really managing is people. And that's what we're talking about with Homegrown National Park. We're managing the people that own all of this land. It has been degraded because of the way we've treated our land, but we can also restore it. So we're talking about changing the culture. We've mentioned that, but it's so important. Right now, it's an adversarial relationship with nature. We must change it to a collaborative one if this is going to work. So what's, what's the rush? We're rapidly destroying the natural world that supports us. Our parks and preserves are not enough. So we've got to practice conservation outside of parks and preserves on private property. Global conservation initiatives, they sound good on paper and the UN's talking about it, but we can't wait for them to actually uh, come up with, with actionable um, um, recommendations. We've been waiting for climate change and it's just not happening. Uh, so the power and responsibility of earth stewardship really resides in the individual, each one of us. That's a new message to most of the people on the planet. Our challenge is to make this a reality, to make it, make it part of our culture. Can we do it? I think we can. Uh, we don't have to save biodiversity for a living, but we can save it where we live. Uh, and if we're doing that, we certainly need to join Homegrown National Park. It empowers each one of us. You know, the, the Earth's problems are huge and most people feel absolutely powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can do all the things we just talked about. They can shrink the lawn, they can put in a pollinator garden, they can get rid of their invasive plants, they can turn out their lights, they can fire Mosquito Joe, they can, they can shrink the lawn, do all the things I forgot to tell you. One person can do that and totally revitalize the, their local ecosystem. And it shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the planet that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you, where you start. If you don't own property, you help somebody who does. So Aldo Leopold said a number of wonderful things. And, and one of them was, there are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot. Now, I know he was talking about the emotional connection with nature, but actually no one can live very long without wild things, for it's the wild things that keep us alive. 